Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. I am joined today by a very special guest. We have Dr. Joel Lubar on the show. Dr. Lubar received his BS and PhD from the Division of the Biological Sciences and Department of Biopsychology at the University of Chicago, and then went on to publish 85 papers, numerous book chapters, as well as eight books in the areas of neuroscience and applied psychophysiology. He was the past president of the Association for Applied Psychophysiology, and he's been the president of the Academy of the Certified Neurotherapist. Uh, Dr. Lubar was responsible for developing the use of EEG biofeedback as a treatment modality for children, adolescents, and adults with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, starting with controlled studies in the mid-1970s. This application of neurofeedback is now becoming widespread in clinics and schools throughout the United States, Canada, Australia, Israel, Europe, and Mexico. Currently, more than 5, uh, 1,500 healthcare organizations are using the EEG biofeedback protocols that Dr. Lubar has developed. Dr. Lubar, welcome onto the show. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. So I wanna, I'm, I'm really curious as far as how you originally kind of got interested in this field of, of neurofeedback kind of in the very early stages. Well, actually, in the uh, very late 1960s and early 1970s, uh, there were some studies that were being done in which both animal and human studies using the technique of opera and conditioning, teaching people to control their blood pressure, and their heart rate, and even a certain type of VEG pattern called the alpha rhythm, which is a common pattern that we produce when we're relaxed, when our eyes are closed. And uh, I got very interested in this. And then there was a study that was carried out at uh, UCLA and supported the VA hospital by a fellow by the name of Barry Sturman, in which he did some animal studies and then a human study in which he trained people with seizures to decrease their seizure activity using a type of biofeedback called neurofeedback, where you train a certain brain rate pattern. And I was always interested in, in epilepsy, not because of any family thing, but just uh, because it was part of general neuroscience and understanding some of the abnormalities of the EEG. And uh, we wanted to replicate that work. So starting in 1973 and 74, we uh, set up a program to train people with very, very severe epilepsy, severe seizure disorders, multiple seizures sometimes per day or per week, uh, to try to control their seizures through training a certain brainwave pattern, which is, has the name sensory motor rhythm, it was discovered way back in the 1960s. And uh, it turns out that when the seizures have a motor component like uh, convulsions or tics or you know certain types of severe muscle movements, uh, it seems to help. It really does seem to decrease the seizures significantly. And uh, so we published a double-blind study, and I published a number of book chapters, and my students and I published papers. And you know, over the years, we published actually more than 150 papers in different areas of neurofeedback now, and new ones coming out all the time. Anyway, the bottom line is that uh, this treatment of seizures uh, using neurofeedback has continued to develop and grow, and there are some new techniques in which we can train not only a uh, particular brain rhythm, but the connectivity, connections between different brain areas. And this helps too. And so right. it's a very interesting, very interesting application. Right, right. I think what you may be alluding to now is the, the QEEG work. And when, when did that sort of get transitioned as far as moving from the traditional neurofeedback to looking at kind of brain scans and kind of looking at the connectivity and then kind of basing the neurofeedback off of that. Is that Actually, you know, in the, in the uh, mid 1980s, uh, and maybe even a little bit earlier than that, there were some companies that developed the ability to record from multiple locations on the scalp at the same time, and to develop a three dimensional topographic picture of what the EG looks like. It's called a brain map. And it was quite interesting because in the mid-1980s, they found that there seemed to be some different patterns of these brain maps associated with different disorders, people with anxiety or you know, attentional problems, 
uh, obsessive compulsive, uh, compulsive behaviors, seem to have somewhat different brain rate patterns. And then uh, in the late 1980s, a company in Colorado Springs, no, I'm sorry, in Boulder, Colorado, called Lexicorp Corporation contacted me and said, could I help them develop some software and uh, the technology further so that they could actually utilize these topographic brain maps, these pretty pictures of brainwave activity, and train people to change these patterns. So uh, they began to use this term quantitative EEG or QEEG to describe uh, the ability to look at multiple locations at the same time. But actually, that term QEEG applies anywhere from one channel to uh, 128 channels, if you want to use that many, or even more. Uh, it's, it's to quantify, because here's what happened. Back in the uh, 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, we used to record brainwaves on paper. We had these great big machines and huge stacks of paper and these pens that would record with ink these squiggles on the paper, which is the EEG patterns. Well, with the advent of powerful computers, it was possible to convert these squiggles into numbers, and that's called digital EEG. And for, when, once we have numbers, then we can use these numbers to develop all kinds of displays, including maps and more complex displays. And so it, then the term QEG, quantitative EEG, came along because now we could convert you know, just the squiggles of lines into actual numbers. And we could do all kinds of mathematics on them to understand better how these EEG patterns are associated with different problems. Right. So the neurotechnology has just kind of evolved more and more since, <laughs> since you've been a part of the field. Interesting thing, though, and that is that when I was working with uh, patients that had epilepsy in our laboratory at the University of Tennessee, and this is back in 74, 75, 76, uh, often is so noticed that uh, sometimes when they learn to control their seizures, their ability to concentrate and focus better actually improved because a lot of these individuals had a lot of problems with that. And I measured the brainwave activity and I noticed that uh, some of these people have a lot of big slow waves in certain portions of their scalp, especially in the frontal part, you know, up toward the front up here. And uh, they didn't have enough what we call beta waves or fast waves. So I thought, well, you know, maybe there's another application for all of this. What if we take individuals that have what they called at that time minimal brain dysfunction syndrome? And then the name got changed to hyperkinetic disorder of childhood. And then finally got converted to what it is today, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. So I was the first one to try this out with some children and adolescents that had what we now call ADHD and found that when they could change this brain rate pattern, their ability to focus and concentrate and do their schoolwork improved significantly. Turns out that the neurofeedback treatment of ADHD is the largest application all over the world, still is. More people are trained that have ADHD using neurofeedback than in the other applications of neurofeedback. Interesting. And can you tell me a little about it as far as what what we've found as far as the different types of ADHD? Do we see different brainwave patterns for, say, someone with more of the hyperactivity versus a more inattentive person? Do we see significant EEG changes? Yes, we do. The, the individuals that are purely inattentive, and then let's take a child or an adolescent, they just sort of lay around all the time and they play video games and they can't focus and they, on anything else, unless it's really, if it's very interesting, they can do it. That's why they can play video games very well. Hmm. But when they're in, the, they're in the classroom and the teacher is lecturing or they have to do workbook problems, they quickly kind of zone out. They just can't keep with it. And they produce a lot of these big slow waves. <laughs> I remember once an incident, this is a long time ago, the teacher was looking at this child and the child looked that way and the teacher said to the child, do you have any idea what I've been lecturing on for the last half hour? And the child turned around to the teacher and said, no, but I just had a great trip to Aruba. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a great example because this is what they do. They daydream and they fantasize and they're in their own little world and they're having a wonderful time, but they're not able to concentrate on anything 
or very few things that they don't understand why it's important. Why do I have to learn long division? It's boring. I don't really care. You know? uh, or why do I have to read this, this dull story that was written 200 years ago? Uh, but if you give them a computer game, they're really good at it. And usually better than people who don't have this problem. So in other words, they can focus when they have to. Now, the inattentive types show this big slow wave pattern. Some of the hyperactive children show a combination of the slow wave pattern and occasionally they produce bursts of very fast waves in certain parts of their brain. And then there are individuals that have a combination of uh, attentive, attention deficit disorder with hyperactivity and they also have conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. They get all kinds of trouble in school. Uh, and uh, oh, can you turn this up? And they get sent to the principal's office a lot. And uh, these individuals have bursts of this high frequency activity intermixed with the slow activity. And then when we get into adulthood, uh, a lot of the adults, instead of producing these big slow waves that are called theta waves, between four and eight waves a second, they tend to produce the normal alpha rhythm, which is eight to 12 waves a second, but it moves into the wrong part of the, of the brain instead of being in the back of their brain where it's supposed to be, especially when their eyes are closed, it moves up to the front of their brain. And so they have this frontal algorithm. <clears throat> and they also complain that I can't concentrate, I can't finish my task. Interesting. So the frontal alpha is something we see more as children kind of transition into adults with ADHD? <clears throat> yeah, adolescents and adults, yes. Okay. So adolescents, it, is there like the theta dominance or the, the theta to beta ratio that I've seen kind of being too high with, with adolescents. Is that, does that change as far as when you move to adulthood? Yeah, actually the, I developed the theta beta ratio back in the 1980s as an observation. I never meant it to be a diagnostic. It really is not a diagnostic. It's just that a lot of individuals, <clears throat> excuse me, especially with the inattentive type, have a high theta beta ratio. But as they move into adulthood, they tend to have more alpha compared with theta. So it, it just changes its frequency, but the pattern of slowing is still there. Interesting. And I, I had seen uh, <clears throat> a little bit of your, your research as far as from a, a 1992 paper on, you kind of were able to, to show the big differences between kind of healthy populations and, and uh, attention deficit populations. Is that kind of what that research kind of encapsulated? Yes, that's right, yes. Okay. In fact, in the, uh, I guess it was 1970, no, let me go back. Uh, it was in the yeah, mid-1970s that we finally began to develop a practice called Southeastern Biofeedback Institute in which we use different kinds of biofeedback, <clears throat> excuse me, including brainwave feedback. My wife and I, Judith Lubach, developed this practice and we practiced for 40 years in Knoxville, Tennessee. And one of my uh, former students who got his degree at the University of Tennessee now has a practice there, is continuing that work. Wow, that's awesome. So can you tell me a little as far as going back to neurofeedback, do we know as far as the mechanisms in which it works, as far as whether it's electrical, chemical, um, whether there's anything as far as neuroplasticity is related, how do, we, how do we know that technology works? Well, there's a number of studies that have shown that when you are increasing this faster activity in the frontal lobe, and particularly if it's you know, a very pleasant and rewarding experience, now I can concentrate, I feel good, I feel like I'm accomplishing something. It's associated with an increase in a neurochemical called dopamine. And uh, this particular neurotransmitter or neuromodulator is very important. Uh, it always increases when there's a lot of reward, feelings of reward. Uh, sometimes it increases too much in certain situations, so it becomes associated with you know, behaviors like gambling behavior, for example. And sometimes it's associated or it can be enhanced too much by certain drugs. Uh, and so it becomes a problem. It can become a, an addiction problem. But we know that these transmitters in the brain, dopamine is one of them, serotonin is another one that's important. 
um, and there are a whole bunch of additional ones that are changed when you change these brainwave patterns. In other words, they're associated with these brainwave patterns. And there's also, there are also studies that show that the blood flow, the actual uh, movement of blood through these little tiny blood vessels in certain areas of the brain increases uh, when an individual is getting rewarded for producing neurofeedback. And this can be measured in an, in an MRI machine and can be mapped on top of a uh, topographic map and it's called functional MRI. And we can actually see that. And Interesting. Yeah. So, it, yeah, so it, it seems like there's, there's really good research like that you alluded to as far as like we know kind of what's going on here. Why do you think that neurofeedback is still something that hasn't been accepted in, I think, a lot of psychiatry or psychology practice as, as a valid treatment? Oh, it's a valid treatment, and it's very effective, but here's the thing. It takes time. In other words, you can give a medication, and psychiatrists can give you know, various medications like anti-anxiety, antidepressant medications, you know, major antipsychotics, and there'll be a very quick behavioral change in the patient. Uh, which may or may not last, but the medication has to be administered continuously for a long period of time to maintain the behavior. Uh, neurofeedback is a learning experience. You're actually learning to train to change this pattern. And when you produce the right kind of pattern, you're rewarded for doing it. We can talk about different kinds of rewards. That's, that's very interesting. But here's the thing. Once you learn the neurofeedback and you practice the way it feels when you produce these new patterns, that can become very long lasting, it can become lifetime. And uh, that's one of the big advantages. Also, you don't have the negative side effects of all the drugs. Uh, everyone's seen all the advertisements on TV, they tell you about this drug will do these wonderful things, but here are all the side effects. And by the time you see all the side effects, you say, do I really want to even try that? Right. <laughs> that sounds too scary to try. Whereas it's... neurofeedback, you know, the, about the worst thing you can say about neurofeedback is it may not work for somebody but it isn't going to damage them. Sure. It seems like something that's kind of almost a reflection of our, our whole, like just Western society's, you know, demand for, you know, the quick fix, you know, having a pill to just quickly try to fix a problem. Whereas, as you're saying, you know, the neurofeedback can be super, you know, safe and effective, but it kind of takes longer to, to kind of do its, its, its work. And then and the other consideration that people will always ask is, you know, it, it, you have to pay for the, you know, the sessions, just like you would for a psychotherapy session or for medication. Uh, is it cost effective? Well, there have been studies that show that if you put somebody on, uh, let's say, a stimulant drug for ADHD, like Ritalin, or, you know, the, the, there's a number of others, Concerta, Adderall, uh, that over a period of, let's say, three or four or five years, the cost of the medication is higher than the cost of the neurofeedback treatment you have been. It's just that it's spread out over a longer period of time. So a neurofeedback is quite cost effective. The other thing that neurofeedback is very effective for and, and it's used a lot, and that is for traumatic brain injury and concussions. So that's another very big application. And yeah, yeah, I would love to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. It works extremely well for that. In fact, I have a neurologist that I work with, Dr. Paul Wan, he just wrote a book called The Concussion Cure. And uh, he talks about neurofeedback, he talks about how you actually uh, evaluate concussions using brain imaging techniques, and talks about a couple of medications that are also quite effective, actually, for helping people who've had traumatic brain injury. Interesting. One, one example where you can do something by increasing the blood flow to certain areas that have been damaged. I was going to say, yeah, I was going to, I was going to ask, is that kind of the main way we know it works is in, mm -hmm. in traumatic brain injuries is kind of restoring blood flow to those regions with impaired blood flow? Uh, restoring blood flow and increasing connectivity. Now that's another whole aspect of neurofeedback. See, back in the 1970s, 80s, and even in the 90s, uh, a lot of the treatment involved putting sensors on the, on the scalp to record the brain wave from a particular area, like here or here and so forth, and training the individual to change that pattern. Well, with very few connectors, and these are just put on the surface, you know, they're painless, uh, we can record the EG, 
you can't really look at the complex connectivity between the different areas, only a couple at a time. But now when we use, let's say, 19 channels or 32 channels, we can record multiple areas at the same time. We can look at all of the hundreds, if not thousands of connections between these different areas. And a lot of the neurofeedback now looks at changing the connectivity. That's a very big part of it. Because it's one thing that, to change the brainwave patterns. It's another thing to, to change how, they, how the different areas communicate with each other. And that's a very powerful part of the new biofeedback or neurofeedback. And then there's another technique. It was developed in 1994. And we're using it extensively. And it has a great acronym. You can't miss it. It's called Loretta. And everybody can remember the name Loretta, L-O-R-E-T-A. It stands for Low Resolution Electromagnetic Tomography. <laughs> Here's what it is. Um, when we look at the brainwave pattern, on the surface. There are places inside the brain that generate that path. And Loretta allows us to find where these generators are located, sometimes deep inside the brain. And so we can not only train what's happening at the surface, but we can now begin to train areas deep in the brain that are producing the surface pattern. And one of the newest applications of Loretta, which is gonna be released in the next month or so, is to train an area of the brain that everyone's kind of ignored, and that is the cerebellum. And the cerebellum actually has almost as many neurons in it as the entire brain, although it's one tenth the size. Mm -hmm. And it's placed in, a, in all athletics, gymnastics, all of that. And the cerebellum has to be very, very accurate. There are all kinds of movement disorders, Parkinsonism, and all kinds of others where the cerebellum isn't working properly. And to be able to train that part of the brain will be very, very powerful. It's going to make, have a big impact on physical therapy and rehabilitation of damage and on a lot of disorders that we couldn't get into until we can do that now. Interesting. So for a whole new field. Yeah. So mm -hmm. from my understanding, Loretta is kind of recreating an fMRI. Um, is you know, that it's, fair to say? It's, it's, that's a good way of putting it. Here's the interesting thing about that. Yeah. I love fMRI. I love MRI. I think it's wonderful. Uh, but here's, here's the positive and the negative. The MRI can really now visualize structures as small as a fraction of a millimeter. So we can see very detailed anatomical maps of these deep structures inside the brain. Whereas Loretta has a resolution of you know one to two centimeters. So it can see some of these deep internal structures, but it, it doesn't see the fine details. However, uh, the brain pattern, the bold response, blood oxygen level dependent response, the movement of the blood flow through the various vessels takes a long time. So to get a fMRI image or an, or an MRI image of blood flow dynamics takes a matter of seconds, not milliseconds, whereas EEG measures at the millisecond level. So whereas we can train activity that's occurring, you know, a fraction of a second, the time resolution is wonderful with EEG. The time resolution with MRI is very slow. So it's a trade-off. But with these new techniques, with these more advanced techniques, you know, it's almost like having a, a little bit of an MRI machine right on your laptop, but it doesn't cost $3 million and a couple hundred thousand dollars a month to maintain it. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, but that doesn't mean that MRI is going to be phased out. MRI is going to become more and more powerful. And as a matter of fact, I predict within five years, it will be possible to see individual neurons wow. in, in the brain. They can already do it in animals. If they go to 17 Tesla, which is a very powerful magnet, you can see individual cells in an animal brain. In the human brain, they have images now that are up to 11 Tesla. And uh, typical MRI is one and a half and sometimes five Tesla. You can see the internal structures at five, but you can't see the individual cells. So when you get up to around 11 or so, you can just begin to see some of the subdivisions of some of these areas. So for example, a patient that has, let's say, Alzheimer's disease, and we know there's an area in the brain called the hippocampus, which is very important for memory allocation and uh, short-term memory storage that area begins to deteriorate, the cells die. 
and uh, <clears throat> there's no treatment for it at the present time. But uh, with a very high resolution MRI, you might be able to see things at the cellular level. Wow, so this is gonna not only reshape the, the fields of, of neurofeedback and, and neuromodulation, but this could have really kind of far-reaching impacts, right? Just for the, the whole treatment of neurodegenerative conditions as you're talking about. Yeah, because actually within the last 10 years, there have been studies published, of, you know, the neurofeedback of the bold response of blood level, oxygen dependent response. You can actually train it. And uh, of course, we're not training it at the cellular level, we're training it in, in whole regions. Uh, and it has been shown to be very powerful. Uh, there's studies that show that with just a few sessions, it can greatly, you know, alleviate depressive problems. So it's very I was yeah, and I was actually going to ask as far as the, you know, it seems like there's very good evidence as far as, you know, when it comes to neurofeedback and ADHD, mm -hmm. um, and you're talking about the traumatic brain injuries, but what do we kind of know as far as treating depression and anxiety with neurofeedback at the oh, moment? Here's the thing. We, there are patterns associated with depression and anxiety. Uh, and once, once we see that pattern, we can train somebody to normalize that pattern. And you know, uh, there are approximately 150 different symptoms, problems that neurofeedback can be used for. So it has a, it has a widening of, uh, application. So subtypes of depression, uh, some types of anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, and even disorders that have to do with sensation. You know, certain types of uh, disorders where people have uh, very sensitive to touch or pain, different pain disorders. Uh, there's lots of those. Disorders that involve uh, tinnitus, which is a ringing in the ears that people often experience, or you know, kind of a roaring sound in their ears. There are whole feedback programs for these things. You know, in the last uh, 10 years, there have been over 10,000 papers published on neurofeedback. So it, it is widely used. And interestingly enough, a lot of the control studies, a lot of the really good studies that are coming out are coming out of Europe. Mm, and, interesting. You know, and that, that's a little bit disturbing. You know, a lot of them from the Netherlands, from Germany, from France, from Japan, you know, over in Asia, and China. And you wonder, well, why is it that they're studying it? And for the reason is because they get funding for it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of money for it. It's hard to get grants now. <clears throat> Money is uh, very, very tight for research. So uh, that's the reason you see a lot of it in other countries. I'm hoping that will change, of course. Do you think it's kind of related to just the power that the, the pharmaceutical giants have in the United States? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some, you know, there's some relationship. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I don't think neurofeedback is gonna be a place on the college at all. I never have seen it that way. I, you know, really, all of these techniques work together. They really do. And we can use pharmacology to enhance the effects of neurofeedback. We can use neurofeedback to enhance the effects of pharmacology. But, you know, the idea is to be able to develop techniques that are more, that are more powerful. You know, in the area, for example, Alzheimer's disease, which affects, I think, something like 6 million people in this country now. In 20 or 30 years, it's going to be double that many. There have been approximately 20 different medications tried. None of them have been successful, not a single one. And uh, there's a new one that, that they're going to be researching soon. And very high doses might actually disrupt the formation of what are called amyloid plaques that you know, begin to damage certain brain areas. If the, that may be the first hope that we have that maybe something will be somewhat successful. But the thing is this, that if we can increase the blood flow, and the, and the interconnectivity in the areas of the brain that are affected with Alzheimer's disease, we might be able to make a significant impact in addition to what, you know, maybe the newer medication might be able to do. Because right. it, it, Alzheimer's disease can bankrupt us. It's going to be so prevalent. Uh, there was once a book written called The 36-Hour Day, and that's what happens for people that have to care for someone with Alzheimer's. It's a it's a, a beyond a full-time job. And as the disease progresses, the, the uh, amount of support for those patients is very, very intense and very difficult. And one can have 
uh, a complete loss of mental faculties, not even know who they are, their family members are, for years. And they can still be alive, you know, their heart's functioning, the kidneys, the liver, you know, the internal organ system, they're all working quite well, but their brain is virtually, you know, almost shut down. Right. And that is a tremendous loss for the family, and it's tremendously difficult to deal with. Absolutely. I, are you familiar with any of uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen's research? Uh, I, I recently read his book. It's called The End of Alzheimer's. And he basically, uh, he's a doctor, I believe, uh, out of UCLA, who's kind of put together um, this kind of holistic uh, treatment where it's like he explains how, you know, almost all of the Alzheimer's drugs are pretty much targeting, you know, acetylcholine in one way or another, trying to, you know, inhibit uh, the breakdown of that neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. But in the book, he kind of explains, you know, somewhat related to, to blood flow and uh, connectivity, basically, uh, you know, utilizing all of the different kind of tools, techniques, technology we have, um, such as with exercise, supplements, um, diet, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't talk too much about um, kind of brainwave training, I don't believe he touches on in the book, but it would be an interesting thing to see if, you know, that could be a component <clears throat> of, of kind of preventing this, you know, real destructive disease. Well, I, I think that, you know, the use of supplements is very, very important. They really are. And there are many of them that can really enhance a lot of function and help with pain and depression and so forth. So I have no problem with them. And I know that, you know, they're not FDA regulated. You have to be very careful where they come from. And some of them can be contaminated with heavy metals, you know, where they're manufactured. But if you research them very carefully and go to very reputable companies, they can be very helpful. Are there any favorites that you have as far as ones we know can increase aspects of brain functioning? I know in addition to just vitamins and, and minerals, there's this whole field of nootropics, yeah. um, but there's, there's a lot and there's like studies that say, oh, it works in, in rats, but we don't know if it does anything in humans. What, from well, your perspective, are, what, what do we know? There are some that, that supposedly enhance cognitive function and they increase succinylcholine and acetylcholine derivatives. And, you know, that's the, basically the idea. And they inhibit, they try to inhibit inflammation of the brain and increase the functions of the mitochondria that produce energy, the sources of energy in the body and in the brain. Uh, and, you know, there are studies that show that it <clears throat> But yeah, as far as, as far as the supplements or, or nootropics, what, any, any favorites of yours? Well, I don't know if it's a good idea to, to mention particular companies, because that might be uh, Oh, no, or just, just whether it's, whether it's different vitamins or minerals or not necessarily, you know, patented, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, brands or anything, but just as far as what has good research on it. Um, well, you know, there's some evidence, for example, that you know, a, a very common substance in food, saffron, which is used a lot in Indian cooking and in Asian cooking and so forth, has a very, it can have a very potent antidepressant effect, actually. And there are some studies that indicate that, that saffron taken on a daily basis can be as powerful as the uh, commonly prescribed antidepressant medications. Wow. And it's, it's perfectly safe. So you have nothing to lose. You can get, you know, saffron uh, substances, tablets, and so forth, and mix it in with food or just take it as a pill, and that can be very powerful. Very cool. Yeah, there are a lot of things out there uh, you know, that, that may be very helpful. And I know that, you know, there there is some problems between the pharmaceutical industry and the medical industry and people that go heavily into just using you know supplements of various kinds because again they're not you know carefully regulated and maybe you don't want them to be too carefully regulated sure not exist. do we so, know anything as as far as the effects of of different uh whether it's vitamins supplements um, on the EEG or even have you seen um, seen anything as far as anything that can increase the efficacy of neurofeedback training well, or are we not there yet? People that, you know, especially children that have attentional problems that if you increase the vitamin D3, that it helps to normalize to some extent their EEG patterns. 
And Interesting. More more. D3 is very, very, see, we don't make D3s. You have to get it from sunlight, from, you know, food. Uh, so a lot of people are, deep, are deficient, especially people in northern latitudes because there's very little sunlight in the wintertime. And so if you go outside in a, in a warm climate, and expose yourself to the sun 10 or 15 minutes a day, you know, and I, that's not enough to do a lot of damage to your skin. It, that boosts the vitamin D production quite a bit. Or you can take the supplements. So that's an important one. And the B vitamins are very important. A for vision is very important. Lutein, L-E-U-T-I-N, I think it's pronounced, is very important in terms of uh, trying to forestall macular degeneration in the eyes. And also for floaters. So there, there's some really good supplements out there that seem to be very helpful. Very cool. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious as far as I want to ask you, other than neurofeedback, what, what's your take on the different, different forms of neuromodulation, such as transcranial stimulation or pulsed electromagnetic frequency, PEMF? Um, do you, what do you see as far as uh, those different methods go? Okay. There, there's some very nice studies that show that they can be very helpful. And ones that are used a lot, for example, is pulse magnetic stimulation. That's one. Uh, another one is actually uh, mild electrical stimulation. There's another one in which they actually take, uh, there's one fellow that I've been working with. He's developed a laser technique where the laser can actually penetrate into the brain about um, a couple of centimeters. And uh, we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to be publishing a paper together on an Alzheimer's patient, uh, which it seemed to really, you know, help quite a bit. The patient's doing much better, or at least deteriorating a lot less, less rapidly with pulse laser stimulation, uh, certain areas in the left hemisphere that are involved in cognition. So is this, I mean, is that uh, like the brain photobiomodulation? Is that? Uh, is, yeah, the pho is brain photobiomodulation is different. Uh, oh, it's not that different because the, the laser technique also uses uh, kind of an infrared level of stimulation, but it's very focused. Whereas the, the uh, photobiomodulation, there's two forms. There's one where they put a, a series of sensors on, on the scalp and they influence larger areas uh, by putting in infrared, usually uh, around 8,000 angstroms or 800 nanometers. That's in the infrared range slightly above where we can see anymore, and even going as high as, as 10,000 angstroms. And uh, so that's one type. There's another in which they actually use a little device that they put into the nasal cavity, into your nose, and it produces pulsed uh, infrared stimulation that supposedly helps the orbital frontal cortex and parts of the frontal lobe. Now, they do find, here's the good thing. The good thing is that sometimes really patients do feel better and these techniques are very helpful. But here's the, here's the other side of it. It's like medication. It, as soon as you stop doing it, they can revert back. Because yes, you can force the brain to change its patterns. That you can certainly do. Whether you use that or you can use uh, trans, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, either alternating current or direct current. These all are very powerful, but there's no learning involved. Now, what we find really works well is when you use these to force the brain, so to speak, into a certain pattern that you think would be a very desirable pattern, let's say to combat depression or anxiety or chronic pain or even seizures. So they're now producing this wonderful pattern and they're doing great. Then we set up, that helps us set up a protocol for neurofeedback so we can continue to say, okay, we know what the pattern looks like, we produce the pattern, now we're going to use the neurofeedback to train you to maintain it. Interesting. That's where, that's where it really works best. So they can work in synergy there. Absolutely. They work in synergy. Just like we can record now, we can record the EEG inside an MRI machine at the same time. And so we can say, okay, as the blood flow pattern changes, we know what the EEG pattern looks like. And that's a desirable pattern. And we can now set up a protocol to maintain that pattern. Right. It's interesting the the stacking of these different technologies now, because the I, I had mentioned to you uh, the doctor I, I work for, uh, Dr. Nicholas Dogris. He likes to basically combine either the the transcranial direct current or alternating current 
or also sometimes random noise or pink noise stimulation um, with the PEMF. So we actually like have mm -hmm. the, the stimulation going and then there's the PEMF, the coils that are actually on, uh, coming on on top of the electrodes. He's called it, he calls it neurofield. And that's uh -huh. and I know him, I know him quite well. And uh, he's doing some really great work in terms of helping people. But again, and I, he does integrate it more now with neurofeedback. And I think he's working with one of our addiction centers down here in South Florida, integrating it with neurofeedback. And I'm working with others integrating, well, we set up neurofeedback in a couple of addiction centers, uh, one here in South Florida, one in Pennsylvania, there's another one in Central Florida that's doing it. Uh, we're all using Loretta training with a lot of our patients too, because we can get at these internal structures. But it all works together. I mean, I'm, a, I'm completely in favor of integrative approaches. The whole concept of what they call functional integrative medicine makes perfect sense. And that's the way to go. And that the other thing which I think is very important as medicine evolves, and that is that the patient becomes an active part of the treatment. The patient works with a team of specialists. And it's not just, you know, doctor, what should I do? And the doctor said, do this, do that. Because, you know, different physicians sometimes disagree on what medication is best. So you work as a team effort and you put it together. Uh, I would, we had a very successful pain clinic for more than eight years at St. Mary's Hospital where I was a consultant in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we met every Tuesday and we had a biofeedback component. We had an anesthesiology component because some patients needed nerve blocks. We had a psychiatry component. We had a neurology component. And we, were, we did it as an integrative thing. And this was back in the mid-1980s, and it worked beautifully. Patients were getting better much, much faster. And they loved it. Yeah, chronic pain, that's a really interesting one, because I think a lot of people may not understand, you know, who aren't in, in the field, that, mm -hmm. you know, if you have pain, you know, in your knee or something, your brain, your brain's perception of that pain is actually, you know, contributing a lot to, to how you feel it. Right. So yes. by going in with techniques, I guess you were using the, the like biofeedback and neurofeedback uh, to actually mm -hmm. kind of calm people's reaction to the pain. Absolutely. See what happens in, 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 when you have an acute injury, let's say you break a leg or a knee or damage or whatever it is. And that area of the, uh, the body is severely inflamed and it's sending tremendous number of signals to the areas of the brain that mediate pain. And so you really experience severe pain. But if the area heals within, let's say, excuse me, three to six months, then uh, the patient says, okay, the pain is gone, I'm doing fine. But if that area continues to keep sending those signals, even after it's healed, what happens is that there are circuits that are set up in the brain, literally, and these are reverberating circuits that keep going and the, the pain continues. And there's a very interesting concept in neurology called the law of projection. The law of projection says that if there's damage anywhere along a pathway that goes from the brain down to the periphery, let's say to the hands or the feet or the arms or legs or whatever, that uh, the person will experience the, let's say the activity in that pathway all the way back to where it starts. In other words, if there's a circuit up there in, in the brain that is, uh, let's say, projects down, let's say, to the hands, uh, or let's say to the right hand, the patient may feel burning pain in their right hand, you know, throbbing pain in their right hand, and when all of the right examinations are done, the hand is fine. There's nothing wrong with the hand. It's the reverberating circuit that's damaged. Uh, or if somebody's had a spinal cord injury or a peripheral nerve injury, uh, they feel the pain all the way back to the very beginning of the, of the pathway. It projects all the way down. And one of the best examples of the law of projection is the phantom limb phenomenon. You've probably heard of that. Yeah. If somebody loses an arm or a leg, they wake up from the surgery and they say, oh, I'm so glad my leg is okay. They reach down and they say, but there's no leg. Where's my leg? Because what happens is that there's a complete image of the leg all the way down to the foot. So let's say the leg had to be amputated from the knee down. They still feel their toes, they feel their lower leg. And the phantom limb pain, the, the reconstruction of that limb by their brain can be very, very frightening to them. 
unfortunately, what happens is that the different nerves conduct at different rates. And the nerves that, that are most persistent are the ones associated with pain. Those are little tiny, little tiny nerves. The larger nerves are associated with touch and temperature and, and some of the other sensations. And those adapt pretty quickly. And after a period of time, the person says, that leg is burning, it's hurting, it's, it feels like it's on fire, it's not even there. But the reconstructed image is now responding to the tiny pain nerve component. And then that is very difficult to treat. But it's a great example of, of the fact that, yes, the pain is in your head. Patients hate that when they say, you mean the pain's in my head? Yes, the chronic pain is in your head. It's a circuit in your head that keeps firing and firing and firing. It's projecting that pain all the way back down to your lower back or your leg or wherever, and you feel the pain. It's mm -hmm. real. Pain is real. Absolutely. And that, from my understanding, that's kind of how the, the opioid medications work is kind of by sort of blunting that, that circuit, right? Where you're, you're sort of decreasing the perception of the pain. There's not actually, you're not actually healing whatever is causing the pain. You're just sort of diminishing those signals that are getting sent yeah, to and from your, your brain to your body. We all know that uh, the opioid crisis is really horrendous now because of the it's tremendously addictive. Patient gets uh, decreased pain, they take more and more of it, and eventually it doesn't work as well, and they are still addicted to it. And that's why we're hoping with you know our feedback approaches and our stimulation approaches that we can overcome that central pain. We can we can take those circuits that are let's say reverberating around inside your brain and shut them down without having the problem of addiction. And it is helping, it does. Chronic pain is very hard to treat, but and neurofeedback has been very helpful. Have you ever seen a case or heard of a case as far as with the someone who has the, the phantom limb sensation and then trying any kind of neurofeedback, biofeedback, is that ever able to be eliminated? Yes, sometimes it has. And in fact, there, there's some neurofeedback programs. I was involved with uh, Dr. Robert Thatcher who developed a lot of the neurofeedback technology and so forth. Uh, we were consultants to a group at, uh, up there in uh, Kentucky where they uh, did a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a large military com complex, Fort Campbell. And we helped them set up a neurofeedback program. And they've been doing Loretta neurofeedback for patients that have come back from the battlefield with severe injuries, with PTSD, traumatic brain injuries, uh, I think the program is now in its sixth year, and it's been very successful, very, very successful. They have multiple setups up there for working with many patients a day and every week doing neurofeedback, or other neurofeedback specifically. These patients have really been helped a lot. And how is, how is, can you explain just a little, as far as for our listeners, how Loretta neurofeedback is able to sort of um, I mean, how, how it kind of differs from traditional neurofeedback, because we talked a little about as far as with Loretta, how we're able to kind of see um, potentially deeper into the brain um, what's actually going on. But then how does that sort of shape the course of the neurofeedback? Well, it's an extension of the neurofeedback. So let's say that we're, we're working with somebody who has severe memory disorder, and it could be, you know, dementia and different kinds of dementia or it could be from an injury. And <clears throat> we look at the Loretta images and we see that, you know, there's certain areas in the scalp uh, that show abnormal patterns. But then we look deeper into the brain and it's an area called, I mentioned it before, the hippocampal formation and the areas around it. And that indicates that, you know, there's rather extensive abnormality there. And sometimes by training that area, to function properly, it then sends the impulses back to the cortex to, to essentially uh, amalgamate or put the memories back better than they were before, so to speak. Or there's another area, a very important area called the amygdala, you may have heard of it, that's very much involved in emotional behavior. And when there are abnormalities in the uh, activity of the amygdala, it can produce extreme fear, extreme anger, uh, tremendous emotional disorders. And with Loretta, we can get to the amygdala, we can train the patterns in the amygdala. We can't do that with just the old surface neurofeedback. 
we can only train what's on the surface. We can't train what's inside the brain. So that's, that's, that's a lot of new things now that are coming out of the, you know, the rub and more feedback now. Right. Yeah, I mean, the amygdala being so kind of connected with the, the fear response, I mean, that seems like that also, that's got to have so many different implications as far as mm -hmm. helping anxiety or PTSD. Um, that seems like that, just that brain area mm -hmm. alone has got to be super, super critical that we've figured out how to actually go in and train that. Mm -hmm. See, that's one of the problems, that, as much as I, I appreciate the stimulation techniques, the neuromodulation techniques, they, they don't penetrate very far into the brain. The amygdala is located deep inside the brain, very deep inside the brain. You can't really get to it with more field and with uh, and some of the other techniques. Uh, they work more closer to the surface. Now, they really affect the connections from the amygdala. In other words, the amygdala sends information to these areas, and by modulating those areas with neuromodulation, it's, there are always two-way connections. It may send the information back to the amygdala and it's sort of saying, okay, quiet down a little bit, you know, indirectly. But if we combine it with Loretta, we can get even better results. Right. And we certainly can't use the neuromodulation techniques at this point to do anything with the cerebellum. It's, it's pretty inaccessible. But again, with neurofeedback in the next month or two, we're going to be able to work with the cerebellum. Yeah, you had mentioned that. So as far as does that have kind of a lot of implications as far as for, for athletic training? It very well may, you know, uh, you know, and it's used in many fields. You know, the interesting thing about the cerebellum is that it, it, it develops what I call motor programs. So let's take somebody who was, you know, an expert gymnast, <clears throat> or let's say an expert musician, they play a keyboard instrument uh, and they can set out the instrument, they can play it flawlessly. The, the motor program that they've worked so very hard to learn, maybe months and months at a time, practicing hours and hours a day, that's stored largely in the cerebellum. The cerebellum is sort of like an old punch card machine and an old IBM machine. It sort of reads out the program to the different parts of the motor cortex, different parts of the brain, and that sends the information down to the hands. If you're playing a keyboard instrument or a violin, <clears throat> or if you're a diver and you're doing very complex gymnastics, it sends it all down there. <laughs> Excuse me. So is that something you think we're going to be able to actually kind of enhance athletic performance by, by targeting that area? Oh, I think there's no question that we'll be able to do that. You know, there are even people who have studied, you know, little things like, can we improve, you know, accuracy in putting a golf ball or swinging a driver and, you know, not slicing and hooking all the time, getting it straight down the fairway. And again, you know, by looking at the brain wave patterns that people produce when they're putting or when they're driving, uh, we begin to see some differences between those that are successful at it and those that are making mistakes all the time. And so there's, there's a lot of interest in enhancing athletic performance. You can see there's a big market there. There's Absolutely. a lot of interest in uh, enhancing, you know, the ability to function in a corporate setting, you know, enhancing the ability to be able to make complex decisions of multitasking and all that sort of thing. So it has a lot of application. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the application of like peak performance of people who, who may not necessarily have a specific disorder or something that they're trying to, to fix per se, but that simply want to enhance, uh, you know, make a good brain great. I mean, exactly. I think that's, that's a super interesting field because, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we view it like, you know, you don't, <clears throat> You don't just go to the gym when you know your arm hurts you know you you go to the gym to to strengthen your muscles so it it seems to make sense that you would want to you know mm -hmm. take your take your brain to the gym and <clears throat> well brain. think of it this way you know the brain actually controls every single cell in our body either directly or indirectly if you look at every cell in the liver the pancreas the spleen you know it doesn't matter where you look you see that there are little nerve endings wrapped around each of those cells and those ultimately connect to pathways that go up to the brain. The brain is influencing the metabolism of those structures and uh, the way the chemicals are produced and utilized and so forth. And, you know, <clears throat> even influences the uh, movement of uh, blood through the various, uh, you know, uh, veins and arteries and arterioles and capillaries and so forth. So the brain has complete control over the body. 
Now, it's true that the body can seem to function more somewhat independently of some of the brain function. Now, people have had extreme brain injury to the point where you know, they're virtually almost brain dead, their heart still beats. They can be kept alive with all kinds of machines and all that. So uh, they can still be made to function. But the brain is, uh, is really controls every cell, directly right. or indirectly. So if we can, if we have, uh, now I'm not saying that, you know, you can use neurofeedback or biofeedback or neuromodulation to, uh, to treat, you know, uh, let's say progressive kidney disease or something like that. I'm not making that kind of an implication. I wish it was true, but n nobody's tried it. <laughs> I don't think so. But uh, we might indirectly be able to help these function, these organs function better. We can certainly use biofeedback. It's been done for years to train cardiac arrhythmias and to, tra and, and to uh, train blood pressure. That goes back to the 1960s. So that, that we know we can do. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, and we can train some of the endocrine responses. Uh, they're called the hypothalamic pituitary axis, release of corticosteroids, and so forth. You know, right. Training, training you know, uh, heart rate variability, that's, that's a really interesting one. I worked in a research lab in college where we, we weren't training it, but we were looking at basically the connection of heart rate variability and the EEG um, with uh, like basically measuring those as participants kind of did a, a task uh, where they could give money to a fictitious charity. So mm -hmm. kind of looking at how those physiological um, responses kind of produce um, behavior, or maybe how behavior produces those responses. Um, but that's, yeah, the, the just increasing heart rate variability seems like a great way just to, to kind of promote resiliency and, and kind of calm your stress response. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Because, you know, decreased heart rate variability is sometimes associated with cardiac disease. Uh-huh. You know, so the ability of the heart rate to vary depending on the demands put upon it is very important. Right. So the old biofeedback society, I was president of that society years ago, and biofeedback society is uh, a society for applied psychophysiology and biofeedback, it used to be called Biofeedback Society of America. Most of their studies, I went to their meeting last year, they had their 50 year anniversary. Uh, a lot of the studies that are presented are on heart rate variability. That's the big issue. That's the big thing for them. <clears throat> Our other society, uh, Applied Psychophysiology, and uh, no, no, uh, Society for um, AAPB, that's the old AAPB Society, International Society for Neurophysi uh, Neurophysiology, Neurofeedback and Research, ISNR. The other one I was president of. That society is the one that's doing all the things we're talking about today. They're advancing everything that we're talking about today. Their mm -hmm. meetings are extraordinarily exciting. You know, all the new developments in neuroimaging, in neuroplasticity, neurofeedback, and brain modulation. Just wonderful. We just had a wonderful meeting in Denver about a month and a half ago. And speaking of those all those developments, I kind of wanted to, to conclude this by kind of asking you kind of, you know, you've seen so much change in, in you know, these fields of, of neuromodulation and, and how the EEG has progressed. Um, what, what do you think the big kind of societal impacts are going to be like uh, in, in coming years? What, what different fields do you think are going to be kind of the most impacted? Well, I think the whole thing is that as patients take more responsibility for their own health and work as a team with the healthcare professionals, that it's going to be, you know, these fields are going to really explode. And, and I think it's going to affect all of the area. For example, uh, at various times, there have been neurofeedback and biofeedback studies in schools to help enhance you know, academic performance. And it's, it's been very successful. And I think that that's one area where it's really gonna be important uh, because you know one, there's a lot of problems that are, as you know, taking place in school settings. And we can really impact that significantly. Certainly in athletics, we already talked about that. Personal growth, all of that. Uh, performance, uh, people who are in high performance professions such as musicians, artists, and so forth, writers, people have 
writer's cramp and they get stuck and they want to write a new novel and they, they are always writing the same thing over and over again and just changing the names of the characters. Can they get out of that and somehow become more creative, creativity, if you want to call it that? I think there's no end to what we can do. There really isn't. I just awesome. wish there I just wish there was more research money in this country and, and we would promote it. I mean it's it's wonderful to see it worldwide. But we've been the leaders in the United States for so many areas. I mean we're the first ones to get to the moon and all of that. Our space program is you know second to none. Why can't this whole field be the leader in the whole world? It's just right. a matter of, you know <laughs> it costs Hopefully that'll change, yeah. <laughs> You know, if we can get the industries, and I've had contracts from different industries to support my research as well as government grants, if we can get some of the industries to do it. And, you know, even even maybe just possibly to get some of the pharmacology companies to, to, to work with the synergistic way. Wouldn't that be a bad thing? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm super excited to see what ends up uh, coming with this field in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, but this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, Can I just say one other thing? Yeah. Right? You know, uh, <clears throat> my own role at the present time is primarily to promote the field through research and through, uh, you know, training individuals, individuals uh, how to use these techniques and through a lot of workshops. So uh, I think that the reason I'm mentioning this is because we're trying to get new people into the field all the time. And we have all kinds of wonderful certification programs now so that people who learn all of this, you know, really are confident in how to do it. And I've worked a lot both developing these certification programs and training people, you know, to become certified. We want people who really, you know, have a good background. The other thing which I'm going to mention, and this will be a little bit frightening, but when new students come to me and they say, I want to go into this area of neuroscience and neurofeedback, and neuromodulation, what do I really need to know in my training besides, you know, psychology and physiology? I said, try to get as much background in math and in physics and mathematical physics as you could possibly follow it. Because here's the reality. I have a stack of papers behind me that's about three feet high. You open any of those papers randomly and it's just filled with higher mathematics. Partial differential equations and all of this sort of thing. Our field is becoming very, very much a mathematical physics field. And uh, that's the way we understand what, so to speak, underlies all these phenomena, development of them. So I encourage students to get as much background as they can in that area if they can. Awesome. And <laughs> where, where would you direct our listeners if they want to know both <laughs> more about your work in particular, um, but also just the whole um, the whole fields or ways to get certified. Where do you have any resources you yeah, direct yeah. people to? They should go to isnr.org, International Society for Neurofeedback and Research.org. They there's a wealth of information about workshops, about meetings, finding practitioners. In other words, so many people call me all the time. I said, I live in you know I know, Poughkeepsie, New York, and I need a practitioner. Or where do I find one? Uh, you know, and where I know where there are practitioners, I, you know, I can refer them. If I don't know, then I, they should go to that site, ISMR.org. There are a list of practitioners all over the country and, and people who are certified. And there's also um, BCIA, Myofeedback Certification Institute of America. And that, that is one of the certifying agencies. There's also one for QEEG, another certifying agency. So that, you know, the field develops. And then there's, of course, the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, AAPB, which was the original field. And that represents, you know, all, all the different areas of biofeedback, including neurofeedback. But ISNR is, is, is brain. It's the brain, okay, <laughs> specifically. So awesome. So there's resources, resources out there. Great, great. Mm -hmm. Well, um, awesome. If you enjoyed the episode today, uh, go follow us, uh, go like, and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, YouTube is Roscoe's wetsuit. Uh, go follow us on Instagram where Roscoe's wetsuit podcast, and you can find us basically wherever podcasts are available, Spotify, Apple podcasts, uh, iHeartRadio. Um, go check us out. Uh, Dr. Lubart, thanks so much for coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure. I'm glad to have had the opportunity. Absolutely.